for this uh, smoking cessation LC supporting implementation of smoking cessation programs in public house and primary care. Next slide. So before we get uh, started, uh, all participants are muted upon, upon entry. Uh, if you have a camera and if you would like to uh, turn it on, please turn your camera on so that we can make this uh, session more interactive. Uh, we are going to try to have an engaging activity. So there will be some uh, poll questions. Uh, you can use the chat or you can use the raise hand icon and your line will be unmuted. Uh, at this moment, the meeting is recorded. So um, this is a requirement uh, from the uh, Health Resources and Service Administration, HRSA. So this activity can be accessed by others who cannot participate on today's uh, session. The slides and recordings uh, and recording link will be sent to you via email and posted to Moodle within a week after our session. You can also visit our website uh, www.nchph.org and go to the uh, resources library page where you can also find the slides and the recording for this session. Next slide. The National Center for Health and Public Housing is uh, uh, so, uh, funded by HRSA to provide training and technical assistance to health centers across the nation. Uh, we work with all health centers, but we offer uh, specific training to health centers located in or immediately accessible to public housing. The, uh, the, uh, the, the content of this uh, session does not uh, reflect HRSA's uh, points or views. Uh, this is solely the uh, uh, the responsibility of the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Next slide. So before we get started, uh, let's have a very brief conversation about uh, community health centers across the nation. This is uh, UDS data, Uniform Data System Data 2020, taken from the Health uh, Resources and Services Administration, HRSA. So for in 2020, uh, 1,375 FQHCs provided services to 28.5 million patients despite the COVID-19 pandemic and despite all the issues and, 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 and problems that we have uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, health centers have been able to provide services to almost uh, 29 million people on different services, uh, not only COVID-19 testing or no COVID-19 vaccination, but they have continued to provide services uh, to patients um, in different areas, uh, uh, diabetes, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, hypertension, and all the uh, dental services and all these uh, services provided by health centers in general. Um, out of the uh, 1,375 health centers, 435 reported being in or immediately accessible to public housing. And in 2020, they provided services to 5.1 million patients. 107 out of the 435 FQACs in or, immediately, in or immediately accessible to public housing are public housing primary care guarantees. These health centers receive a funding from HRSA to provide services to public housing residents. And in 2020, they serve almost 900,000 patients. Next slide. We've been working on smoking cessation since HOT established the uh, rule on uh, prohibiting uh, smoking in public, uh, on public housing premises, including public housing developments and public housing uh, agencies. Since then, we have provided uh, webinars, we have uh, done uh, LC sessions, uh, publications, and uh, it's really interesting to, to just discuss the demographics of those, of those living in public housing uh, and how this particular population 
is affected by uh, social determinants of health. Uh, just to give a, a brief overview, uh, around 1.7 million people live in public housing developments, and the 33% of those are uh, female-headed households. 55% um, of them have less than a high school diploma. 43% of uh, those living in public housing are African-American, 25% uh, Hispanic, 37% children, 52% uh, white, 35% are patients over the age of 65, 38% are disabled, and 93% of them are, uh, are low income uh, uh, residents. Next slide. And there is a publication, this is a hot CDC publication, uh, providing data on the health status of those living in hot assisted uh, facilities. And um, as you can see, those receiving assistance from HUD are more likely to have or to suffer from some of uh, the chronic conditions such as over, uh, either they're overweight or have some disability, uh, COPD, diabetes, or asthma. And that when you compare those living in public housing, those who are current uh, smokers, you see that they are uh, one of the population who are more likely to, to smoke due to different um, uh, factors that we are going to discuss uh, later on the uh, uh, next uh, presentations or, or sessions. Next slide. So for this uh, learning collaborative, uh, you can have access to, to Moodle uh, through this platform. You can, uh, you can uh, establish an account and get all the resources that we are going to share with all of you, the links to uh, additional resources, uh, a welcome packet where you will find information about the content and learning objectives. You can also find um, uh, links for the uh, previous recording in case you want to go over some of uh, the information that we are going to provide. And uh, you can also interact with others, uh, per, uh, participants to establish some best practices. Next slide. So uh, we are trying to have four 60 minute uh, live Zoom learning sessions. So uh, these are going to be uh, interactive uh, sessions. Uh, please feel free uh, to send your questions through the chat or just uh, um, unmute your, your, uh, your line and ask your question directly to our panelists. Uh, again, you can access Moodle and you can find all the resources and uh, please complete the post evaluation surveys for each session. Next slide. So before we get into the nitty gritty of this first session, um, we would like just to ask your name and role, the health center name or your organization. If you are not with a health center, public, you can be with a public housing agency or any other organization. You please share that information and the city and the state that you're in. So we're gonna give uh, just a few seconds so uh, you can, uh, let us know your name, your role, your organization, and the city and state that you're in. For that, you can use the chat. Uh, uh, if you go uh, at the bottom, you will see the chat icon, and then you will find, you will be able to type, uh, again, your name, your health center name, and the city and state. We have already received. One comment. Uh, and we have, uh, I'm sorry if I am going to mispronounce your name, uh, Sharan, Sharan Hit uh, Shima, and she is the clinical manager with the uh, Bay Area. Community Health Center in Fremont, California. Thank you so much for joining us. We have uh, Dr. Godi, uh, Chief Medical Officer at, uh, at Athens, Georgia. Thank you so much for joining us. 
I have Amy Sullivan, clinical pharmacist, director of clinical pharmacy services at Lowell Community Health Center at in Lowell, uh, Massachusetts. All right, thank you so much. Next slide. So uh, for today's session, uh, we are going to have uh, Frank Vitali leading the conversation. And uh, Frank has been working with the National Center and providing his expertise for many years, conducting uh, webinars and, and all kinds of activities uh, for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Um, so Frank is the National Director of the Pharmacy Partnership for uh, Tobacco Cessation and has worked in the smoking cessation field since 1987, designing cessation programs and educating over 20,000 health professionals in how to help patients stop tobacco use and counseling nearly 10,000 patients to quit. He received a BA in liberal arts from St. Vincent College in 1974 and a master's degree in psychology from Duquesne University in 1988. He entered the field as a health educator, then as a clinic coordinator for the lung health study, researching the differential effects of the smoking cessation and an inhaled medication on the prevention of COPD in identified high-risk individuals. Fran followed this by becoming a project director of Lung Health Study II. Uh, subsequently, he created a six-hour CE program, the International Smoking Cessation Specialist Program, designed to teach pharmacists how to do a smoking cessation counseling, writing the patient support booklets that accompany this training, as well as all auxiliary materials. This program has been presented throughout the US, Puerto Rico, Spain, and the United Kingdom. In addition, he contributed, uh, he, he contributed content material for the Rx for Change curriculum from, 20, to, from 2007 to 2012. And Frank continued to provide cessation counseling training to pharmacists through various projects with the uh, c 2 day program. Recently, he designed a cessation training program and intervention protocol for psychologists in Beijing, China, as well as for the HYB grocery chain in eight Midwestern states. He's currently a clinical assistant professor at Purdue, Co Purdue College of Pharmacy, working on a myriad of projects designed to train pharmacists, physicians, respiratory therapists, and other clinicians interested in adding cessation counseling to their practice. So, Frank, thank you. Good afternoon, and take it away. Thank you, Jose, and welcome to everybody. Um, I see we're all around the country, and I'm in Pittsburgh, where it is now raining. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a good activity for me on a rainy afternoon. Um, so, as, as Jose said, I've been working um, with the um, National Center for many years now, and last year I created a series of trainings that gave individuals at the health centers a basic knowledge of what to do to help their patients quit smoking. This year, we've expanded it into some specific areas to help patients either stay quit or in the case of next week, if they relapse, how to help them um, get back to um, not smoking. So this week, we're gonna be talking about what I think is probably the reason why most people tell us they don't quit smoking and the, the reason why most patients who do quit tell us they've gone back. And that is this idea that smoking somehow helps them deal with stress. So we're gonna talk about that today. Next week, we're gonna talk about pre preventing relapse and then how to deal with it once it happens. The following week, we are going to look at what we can do to help our patients who have behavioral health issues and or substance abuse problems. The general belief is that individuals with behavioral health or substance abuse issues don't want to quit, can't quit, or it, it, it's more difficult for them to quit, all kinds of issues around that. So we're going to explore the realities there. And then in our final session, we're going to be looking at some specific case studies um, and asking you to really give us um, some of your input um, on how to um, deal with those specific uh, cases that we'll bring up. But in the meantime, I want you to be thinking about bringing a case of your own um, to that uh, fourth session at the end of the month. So think 
about this or find somebody, someone that you've had a particularly difficult time or it's been a challenge. Um, and then we can all work on help, helping you figure out how to deal with that. All right, so um, as Jose said, I've been doing this a long time. So, um, you know, I, I have a very short introduction now, or we can shorten my introduction to say he's old and he's done this a long time. <laughs> um, it's been 34 years now. So I tell you that not to brag or anything, but to let you know that I've probably encountered almost any problem or any situation that can come up in this field. So while you have me ask questions that um, you have about how to deal with this um, subject with your patients, don't hesitate to ask me whatever you want as we go along here. Um, and as we're both indicating, we really want this to be interactive. Um, so don't be afraid to unmute yourself. We're a small group, so you know we're not gonna be talking over each other. Or if you're uncomfortable with that, just type in um, the question in the chat. Um, and if I don't happen to see it, Jose probably will, and um, you know, he can uh, cut in and um, talk about it or ask me the question. All right, so <laughs> stress management and smoking. So what we're going to look at here is what is the, what's the, the reality here and what is the myth? Oh, there it goes. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to get these things started. <laughs> Whoa. What you do? All right. Yeah, with Zoom, it takes a while to. Now it's going. Now it's going through everything. Let me see here. I'll get it to go backwards. All right, let's see. All right, <laughs> back to the beginning. Sorry about that. As I said, sometimes it takes a while for these for the uh, controls to kick in. All right, so what are our objectives here? We're gonna look at the myth that smoking is an effective way to deal with stress and debunk that. We're gonna look at other real stress management techniques that can be used to maintain a quit and then talk about how to teach those techniques to patients. So my first question here for all of us is where does stress come from? So let's start with that. Think about that for a moment and either unmute or put it in the chat. Where does stress come from? Anybody have any thoughts on that? That your kids, your spouse, <laughs> your work, whoops. All right, well, stress is, oh, okay, stress, okay, Chantel says stress comes from our daily environments. Okay, only to a certain extent. It, what I'm wanting to get at is it's your internal response to your daily environment. So it's your internal response to external events. It's not the event itself that causes the stress, stress, it's how you respond to it. So let's say, take an example of going to the dentist. Let's say you, all of you think about, you know, you, you go to a dentist and I go to the dentist and we both have exactly the same problem and exactly the same tooth. You walk in there and just sit down at the, in the chair and say, okay, just fill the tooth, no big deal. Um, I don't need any Novocaine, <laughs> I'll be fine. I, on the other hand, am stuck in the doorway, shaking like a leaf, sweat pouring off of me, and I'm in a panic. So what's the difference there? What's the difference between what you're doing and what I'm doing? Well, the difference is our internal conversation with ourselves. Okay, you're probably saying to yourself, that's oh, no big deal, no problem. I, on the other hand, am probably saying, oh my God, this is going to kill me. I'm going to fall apart. This is really going to hurt. Uh, you know, all those negative emotions. So I'm giving myself the messages that create the stress while you're giving yourself the messages that create 
calmness and relaxation and no stress. So this is a really important issue. This is a really important concept to understand right at the beginning here. Stress is, is your internal response to external events. So the answer to dealing with it has to come internally. It can't come from something outside of you, okay? So if you give, give me that and we'll start with that. So what is the myth here around cigarettes and smoking? Well, it's that smoking gets rid of all that stress, that there's somehow, and I've had people tell me this, they actually believe there's some chemical like Xanax or, Zan, or uh, Valium in cigarettes that somehow calms you down and relaxes you. And that it somehow then helps you deal with your kids, your boss, this, your spouse, which leads them to believe and really firmly believe, and you're going to hear this a lot, is that I can't live without cigarettes. I can't cope. And in fact, if I did try to stop, my life would fall apart. And I've actually had people tell me that. My life would fall apart if I didn't have cigarettes in them. So this is a very strong internalized belief that they can't function and that they can't deal with all the stress in their life without cigarettes. So we really have to look at this in depth when we deal with our patients. So where does this come from? Well, our culture and particularly the cigarette companies way from the beginning have promoted this idea. So if you look at these ads, they all show happy, good looking, relaxed, people, or they are placed in places that we consider to be calming and relaxing, like meadows on the water. And these are just a few little examples that I found, you know, after just a few minutes of ex exploring, but you know, you can, if you're old enough, you can remember a lot of the ads, you know, we're just um, showing people in all kinds of very relaxing, calm, happy situations. So the cigarette companies have promoted this from the start, and then we've embraced it as a culture. So, oops. so what is really happening? Okay, so if smoking can't do this, if it's there is no chemical in the cigarette that does calm you down or relax you, but many people do claim to be cal more calm and relaxed when they when they smoke. What's happening? Okay. Well, what is really happening are two things. First of all, on the one hand, is smoking is to get rid of stress, it causes it. If you look at physiologically what's going on in the body when someone smokes, their heart rate and their blood pressure go up. And then once they finish smoking the cigarette, it drops back down. So all day long, they're going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. So that puts a lot of stress on the body. But as the slide says, many people do feel more calm and relaxed after they smoke. So something is going on. And indeed there is. It's not some chemical. It's not some magic ingredient in, in, in the tobacco that does this, but it's rather three things that are happening. One of them is deep breathing. So every time you take a puff on a cigarette, you are doing deep breathing. And it's the same kind of deep breathing that occurs when you are doing um, yoga, meditation, natural childbirth, all that kind of stuff. Then because you are smoking and not really paying attention to what is bothering you, you're not focusing on it. So you're taking a break. And then there's the reuptake of nicotine. So let's look at each one of these individually and see how they contribute to this. All right, we know, or you, we, I would hope that we know that deep breathing has been taught for the last two or 3,000 years as a way of calming and relaxing and centering yourself. It's in almost every um, religion, religious practice all over the world. Um, it is used uh, especially in meditation, yoga, karate, um, all the jujitsu, all of those things depend on deep breathing. And then all the women know that this is the, the cornerstone of natural childbirth. So it's taught in all those situations and used in all those situations because it works. So our smokers 
everyone who smokes is actually practicing deep breathing. They just don't realize it. And they think they have to have a cigarette in their mouth to do it. So the natural way of smoking, the natural process of taking in the smoke is the same thing as deep breathing. So the important education piece here is you already know how to do this. I don't have to teach you anything. You just have to start doing this without the cigarette. So this does actually help calm and relax a person. But as I just said, they think they have to have the cigarette in their mouth to do it. Of course they don't. So that's number one. Number two is shifting focus. So think about this. When you are in a stressful situation, no matter what it is, what do you tend to do? Well, you tend to think about it, right? You focus on it. I call it fussing. You know, you get the thought in your head and it just keeps rotating, you know, rolling around like a, the old tape, tape recorders. And you just, it, you focus and focus on what happens and that thought builds and builds and builds and builds. And that's where the tension comes from. So what happens when you are smoking? Well, you're taking the cigarette out, you're lighting it, you're, you know, whatever. But no matter what the process is, you are shifting focus from whatever is bothering you. <clears throat> so if you actually smoke during a stressful situation, you might experience less stress because you're not focusing on the event that is causing you the stress. So the shifting of the focus actually what reduces tension and anxiety. And the fact of the matter is, and if you think about this, most people in many situations go somewhere else to smoke than where they are working or playing or whatever they're doing. They, they actually physically go somewhere else. So they're, they're shifting focus in that respect too. They're, they're actually not only internally doing it, but externally doing it. So this actually does help reduce stress and anxiety. So these two things are in the person's control. They can do the deep breathing. They can shift the focus on their own. They just need to realize that that's possible and that they can do it without a cigarette. So those are the two things that you want to teach people right at the beginning when they um, are, uh, when you're looking at this. Now, the third thing is what happens physiologically, okay? Now, when you smoke a cigarette, you give yourself a huge hit of nicotine. And that nicotine hits the brain in about 11 seconds and it causes the brain to release neurotransmitters, primarily dopamine, serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, all those chemicals that help you feel good. And because there's so much of it and you get, so, it, get it so fast, it's very reinforcing and very pleasurable. However, the moment you stop smoking that cigarette, all those levels begin to drop and drop and drop. So maybe 25, 30 minutes later, the person is in withdrawal. And that is irritability, anxiousness, restlessness, impatience, all kinds of negative emotions. Now, guess what? Those are exactly the same feelings that one has when they're stressed. Irritableness, anxiousness, restlessness, impatience. So when this person feels all that after they take, after they smoke the cigarette, how do they get rid of it? Well, they smoke another cigarette. So they smoke another cigarette to relieve the withdrawal and they feel better. But what happens is they mix up getting rid of withdrawal with getting rid of stress because they feel the same. So let me be clear on that. They're not getting rid of stress, they're getting rid of withdrawal, but they mix the two up because they feel the same. And think about this, a smoker is in withdrawal all day long. That's primarily why, one of the reasons why they are smoking is to get rid of that withdrawal. So they're bound to be in withdrawal at the same time they are experiencing something in their environment that is upsetting them or angering them or causing them anxiety. So they smoke to get rid of the withdrawal, but they also think that it's helping them get rid of the stress. So 
you need to really teach people that this is what is really happening. This is the cornerstone for me in, what, in my working with patients about helping them break this myth is to teach them that the two things they control, the deep breathing and the shifting of the focus are indeed within their control. And then what's really happening chemically is they're getting rid of withdrawal. If they didn't smoke, they wouldn't be in withdrawal. They wouldn't be experiencing this. And as a matter of fact, if you look at physiologic data that they've done in studies with people who quit smoking, they are actually more calm and relaxed than they are when they smoke. So this is the key things that you need to teach an individual. All right, being a little slow here. All right, so you teach people all this, are they just going to say, oh, wonderful, okay, I understand that, and, um, and then actually um, know what to do? Well, the reality is, of course not. It, the reality is that most people don't know, most people who smoke really don't know how to deal with stress because what have they been doing in all those stressful situations? They've been smoking. So they honestly have very little skill level in being able to deal with all of these stressful situations in their life. And so it's important for us to teach them healthy ways to deal with stress. So this gets into, there are seven uh, different points I would like to make in, in, um, in respect to this. So there's two parts to this. You're, you're debunking the myth, but then you're teaching them healthy ways to deal with stress. And so not all of these are going to appeal to everybody. So what you want to do is offer a menu here of different ways to um, you know, deal with stress in a healthy manner. Now, as a health center, you could, if you want, if you wanted or somebody there, start to create some stress management classes or do something like once a week or a couple of times a week with an individual, uh, with individuals or in a group where people can start to learn these. Um, techniques. So this is something that you could easily incorporate into um, the everyday routines at, the, at your particular center. So let's talk about each one of these in turn. Sorry again, this is this. All right, so the relaxation technique. This is something that's been around a long, long, long time. And it's essentially, you probably may know how to do this or may have done this in other contexts, but it's essentially finding a quiet place and then closing your eyes and then picking a very short phrase or word that you can just repeat. And then once you have that and once you're in a comfortable spot, then you want to tighten all of the muscle groups top to bottom let, and then let that go. And as you do that, slowly take in your breath, hold it, then let it out. This is a very, very basic meditation technique. Um, there are lots of variations on it. I'm just introducing this to you as something to, to start to think about. But any, any kind of deep breathing, any kind of yoga, meditation, all that kind of stuff fits into this. But this is a very simple thing that you can teach people. Um, I used to do this with when I was running groups. I did it right in the group. Um, and it was really quite effective because most people have never done anything like this. And so once they do it, they really find that they do get some relief um, and do feel better. Now, this is a very basic, simple thing, but many people don't think about it. And especially in many of our, um, in many different cultures, this is not something people are encouraged to do. So it's a new thing. So this may be something where you uh, can make an impact just by suggesting that the individual start to talk to somebody about their problems. Now, they may not have a lot of friends around or friends that they trust. So maybe there's a clergyman. Um, we know there are many now, many apps and websites where you can you know, chat with people. Facebook has all kinds of groups. Um, there are specific chat rooms. Um, there are even chat rooms for people who are quitting smoking. So, this is all something I think is very important. Um, having a background in psych and in therapy, obviously I would. 
And if the person has the opportunity then to go to a therapist, if there are issues uh, around their smoking that are deeper, then that is something you might want to suggest. But simply just saying to somebody, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling uptight, I'm feeling um, you know, worried about all this. Just saying those words in many cases um, is enough to start to relieve some of that. So again, don't hesitate to suggest this to your patients. An excellent way to deal with stress is to prevent it by being active. The more active you are, the more you use your body, the less stress you're going to encounter. Well, not, not, you're not going to encounter it less. You're going to be able to deal with it better. I, I misspoke there. Yeah, the more active you are, the more, more insulation you have against stress. I guess that's how I would say. And the, the better, at, most, you know, you're better equipped to deal with it. So this does not mean you have to get into a uh, exercise class or start working out at a gym, but um, it can mean just taking a long walk every day. So that might be something you could very easily do. It's not going to cost anything at your center is just to start a walking group and get people out for a half an hour in the neighborhood around the building or you know, wherever um, to, to get some activity, to get some exercise. Stretching every morning, yoga, tai chi, any of that stuff is good. If you live near a center that has a, uh, a swimming pool, uh, swimming is an excellent activity because it does, it engages your mind in a sense and it kind of allows you to zone out. I have several friends who swim and, and they say that that's exactly what happens while they're in the water. They're not thinking about anything, um, it's just, focusing on the feeling and the movement. And it's a great way to um, give themselves a break from whatever's going on in the day. Um, a formal exercise program, if that's possible, certainly encourage that. Uh, you know, doing weights um, uh, is, a, is a great stress reliever on, you know, for the body and the mind. Um, any kind of you know, Zumba, and, you know, any aerobics classes, all those kind of things. And then finally, if those aren't something that appeal to the individual, how about find a hobby that you enjoy or find go back to something you did many years ago, especially something that, that you have to concentrate on. So again, if you're not, if you're concentrating on whatever the uh, activity is, you're not thinking about whatever your problems are. So that does tend to be able to help you um, feel less stress. Now, as I, as I really reinforced at the beginning here of the talk, stress is an internal response to external events. So changing your cognition around that can have a big impact. So changing how you think about what these situations are, what, what is happening to you um, can have a, you know, a profound effect. So you want to reframe what you consider to be a problem is to really look at what am I, what am I thinking is wrong about this situation? What, how is that impacting me? Um, and then honestly think about that belief that smoking is going to make things better. I actually have some people who, who feel that the cigarette is a friend and that on some level, it kind of tells them what to do. Now, they don't actually believe that it's talking to them, but, I, but I, what I think is happening is that because they are thinking about things, whatever that may be, while they're smoking, they're coming up with their own answers. And the smoking is just an excuse to give themselves some time. So that's, that's a very good, what place to start here is to reconsider how you think smoking is helping you and to realize that it isn't. You know, that's the other, the flip side here. Uh, you know, I always joke when somebody says to me, if it's my best friend, well, what kind of friend steals your money, ruins your health, and lowers your self esteem? Because that's what smoking does. Um, then, you know, visualize yourself. This is a very powerful technique uh, used again for the last 2,000 years. So it's to see yourself in a stressful situation, successfully coping with it without a cigarette. So it's almost mentally rehearsing how to deal with these situations without smoking. So that's something you can work with a 
um, a patient to begin with to maybe actually role play with you about how to deal with the situation without smoking. And then that once they get good at that, they can um, then start to visualize it uh, without your help. And then finally, I always like to teach people this, just because you think about something doesn't mean you have to do it. So in a stressful situation, just because you think about having a cigarette doesn't mean you have to smoke it, right? Because if we did everything we ever thought about in our lives, where would we all be? Well, we would either be dead in jail or dead in jail. So the fact of the matter is, is just because you, you have that thought, I want to smoke, uh, you know, I need a cigarette, uh, cigarette's going to help me, doesn't mean you have to do it. So that's another very powerful thing we can teach our patients. Stopping yourself is, you know, this is an actual cognitive technique that's taught in a lot of different situations. So I like to, to tease this out by actually instructing the person to say stop, take a step back, maybe literally take a step back and then ask themselves, <clears throat> One of these three questions or subversion, you know, how would smoking make this any better? So you're having a fight with your spouse. And the first thing you think of is, you know, I need a cigarette to get through this. Stop yourself right then and there and say, okay, what, how's this going to make it any better? The fact of the matter is, is that it's going to make it worse because then you're going to feel guilty about smoking. What would I think of myself if I did smoke? So especially for somebody who's been quit for a few weeks, this is a very powerful thing. They, you know, they could become very disappointed in themselves. They might beat themselves up if they have that one cigarette. And then this is a sure step in many cases to leading someone to full-blown relapse. And then another question to ask is, okay, if smoking isn't really gonna help me, what can I actually do to make the situation better? So here's where you're starting to strategize with yourself about solutions that actually do work. And then the final bullet point I think is important to realize because I hear this all the time. I got so mad at my wife that I went and bought a pack of cigarettes and I smoked all of them. And the, the, the belief there is that you're somehow or another, and I never quite understood this, but <laughs> you're somehow or another getting back at the person, you're punishing them, and usually it's because the spouse really, really wants you to quit smoking. But the point here is that it's not a good way to punish anybody because it doesn't work. All you're hurting is yourself. So think about that. If you smoke thinking you're gonna, it's gonna get back at your, uh, your spouse or your kids or your boss or whatever, that's not, that doesn't work because the only person you're hurting is yourself. I like to teach these phrases. So when you get in a situation where you're thinking, I want to smoke, I want a cigarette, I want to, you know, I'm mad at my spouse, have a phrase that you can just pop right in that will shift your thinking from that negative to something positive. So the reality is every single problem on this planet that anybody has ever had <laughs> has a solution that does not involve smoking. And, and what I like to point out to them is think of only about 14% of the population smokes, right? So remember that only 14% of the adult population in this country smokes. So what are the other 86% um, of people doing to deal with their stress? If they're not smoking, they must be doing something. And I, and I think people don't realize that. The vast majority of people on the planet somehow deal with their stress without smoking. So there are other things you can do. Um, a nice short phrase, I'm in control. I like that one because in many cases, what the smoker has done is given control of their life over to the, um, the cigarette. I am strong, I can handle this. I'm proud of myself. I am calm. So any, anything like that can be a very powerful um, help. Meditation, you know, if, if a person is of this ilk, 
um, suggest that they spend a half an hour, you know, either first thing in the morning, last thing at night, either in meditation and prayer. There are these thought, thought for a day books that you can get that has one thought each day to help you uh, as a guide. Um, you, you know, uh, journal. This helps many, many people just to write everything down. And that's a good way to get all your anger out and all the anxiety that you're experiencing. Or, uh, you know, there may be a group at your uh, place of worship, whatever that may be, that is focusing on um, meditation and prayer. I like to throw this in now more so than I did 30 years ago, because our culture, especially in this country, has become so rushed and so overwhelming for so many people that it causes stress just from living your day-to-day -day life. So any of these techniques just to slow down may help you. Um, find some place where you're away from your family and your friends and just be quiet. It's interesting, so many people are afraid to be by themselves or not do anything for 15, 20 minutes a day that I think it might be helpful to try that and to experience what that's like. Um, if you have a garden, you know, find a spot out there. Um, don't be so rigid that you get go nuts because you have to have all these things done in this order by this time every day, um, all the time. You know, be a little spontaneous. Don't be so rigid. Um, slow down your meals. So many of us eat on the run now. That actually causes a lot of stress. So maybe at least dinner sit down at a table without a phone, TV, all the other distractions, and just eat. Uh, turn off everything. You know, again, we are so used to being connected to everything. That causes a lot of stress. Um, and, you know, just spending a few minutes every day on your own without all those devices can be very helpful. A friend of mine talks about this, and I really like it. He calls it tolerating. So, we, we know there are big things in our lives that cause all kinds of problems. Um, and we're you know, used to that, but I don't think what we pay attention to and what we realize is there are a million little things that in and of themselves aren't a problem, but when you add them all up and when you have these little irritations all day long, they can cause a lot of stress. So in many cases, if you just stop tolerating all this stuff, that can lower your stress level um, considerably. Other things you can do, get a pet. You know, we, I think half of my neighborhood now has a dog. <laughs> I've never seen so many dogs in my neighborhood um, over the pandemic. Um, you know, I have a very big garden, so I find that to be very relaxing. You know, uh, old hobby, learn a new craft. Get, get out of your head. You know, volunteer somewhere, go to a hospital. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable right now going to a hospital because of the pandemic, find something in the community. There's many organizations. You know, my community here in Pittsburgh, uh, you know, we only have about 18,000 in my neighborhood, and we have probably seven or eight community organizations that you can do all kinds of things. Uh, you know, work in the community gardens. Uh, you know, pick up weed or pull weeds, pick up trash, all kinds of things. So explore what's available in your area. And then, you know, what can you do specifically at your clinic? And I've touched upon some of this. So I really, if you don't have anything like this, would suggest that you create a, a stress management group at the clinic where you can actually um, work with people on a weekly basis to learn how to deal with this, with their stress, uh, teach visualization, uh, have a walking club. Uh, the quit line is a great, great source for many people who are quitting where they can actually have somebody who is trained in cessation to talk to. So make it a, a, a routine part of your care to refer people to the quit line. And then I love this. Many places around the country, and I've been doing um, different trainings with you know, different components with the with uh, your national center, and then a lot of the behavioral health places around the country that have these smoking areas. They've turned them into little Zen gardens, and these are places where people can go and and maybe work in the garden a little bit, but even more importantly, just sit there quietly 
So in the, it becomes a uh, clean air, uh, you know, healthy lungs place rather than a smoking area. And then I, I really suggest that one of the things that is important for you to do is to role play with your patients about ways to deal with stress. So here is just a um, sample uh, instructions on what you can do with a patient. Find a quiet spot. Ask the patient before you do this to describe a typical situation where they used to reach for a cigarette. Then have the patient close their eyes and you describe that situation back to the patient while instructing them to see themselves successfully dealing, it, dealing with it without smoking. So this is guided imagery. You, know, you are helping them deal with a very real situation without a cigarette. And this is a great way for you to connect with your patients if you have the time um, and, then, you know, and then discuss the results one way or the other with the patient. Educate. I, I love to point this out to people. You know, if you look at the shape of a cigarette, it looks like, and it very well could be, and, and many people consider it this, a magic wand. You know, the kind of bing, bang, boom, it cures all my problems. So it's really important to point out the reality of it, that it's nothing more than paper and dried up leaves. So a favorite question of mine is how can paper and dried up leaves take care of all your problems, <laughs> take care of all your stress. And when you start to do that, when you start to debunk a lot of those beliefs, then you can see um, that the individual, you can tell the individual, you know what, that's all this is. It cannot and never has been able to get rid of stress or help you with anxiety or tension, anything in your life. So if that thing can't do it, how, have, how has this been happening in your life? Well, it's pointing out to them that they've been doing it. They have been dealing with all the stress. They've been, good or bad, they've been dealing with it all their life. They've just chosen to give the credit to the cigarette. So the ending message when you're working with these patients is that you have dealt with your own stress your whole life. You just haven't realized it. Quit giving the cigarette the credit. And so then you can create, and, I, and I've given you a, um, a worksheet that you can work with patients to create a personalized stress management plan. And you can maybe uh, in, um, complete this with the patient or have them do it and then um, bring it back to you to discuss it. Uh, so you can eliminate, and it's essentially four categories. Eliminate stress by doing blah, blah, blah. Deal with stress that does occur by doing, uh, relax. And then I will get rid of the following little toleration. So I've given you a, a handout um, that you can use to work with patients around all that. Okay, so to summarize here, smoking does not get rid of stress. It causes it. Why do people think that it does? Well, they mix up getting with, rid of withdrawal with getting rid of stress. And again, point this out to people. There are millions and millions and millions of people who have all kinds of stress in their life and problems who don't um, smoke. So it doesn't give anybody any magic way of dealing with it. And on top of that, people who do smoke still have problems. So again, it's that belief that it makes all their problems go away doesn't make any sense. And then our role here is to help individuals learn healthy ways to deal with it. So this is my contact uh, information here. Now, if I can figure out how to do this, uh, I have a video that I would like you to watch. It's only four minutes. It's a good way to conclude. So, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, but I couldn't include it when I sent this to Jose because it was too big of a um, uh, um, file. So I don't know if I can, okay, let me end this. Let's see if that works, okay. Now let me share my screen. Wait, here's, all right, this is mine. All right, here it is. Oh, all right, this actually might work. <laughs> all right, let's make this back up to a full screen. All right. So this is a patient who has come to the um, uh, healthcare professional 
for some advice about quitting, but there is an issue about dealing with stress. So I want you to see, this is only four minutes. So I want you to see how you can incorporate this advice into a regular um, session with a patient. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I can't. Your blood pressure has gone down. Oops, okay, Fide. Sorry to interrupt. I don't know if anybody else is having issues seeing the video. I can't see it. You can't see it? Okay. I cannot see it either. Uh, you can't? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. All right. I thought I was sharing my screen. It says you are sharing your screen sharing, but you can't see it. Okay. Let me stop sharing this one. Now we can see it. Now okay. Can. Yeah. Are you, you know, okay. Good. six days but uh, one thing uh, i've been having these really weird dreams all right like what uh well last night i dreamt a red dinosaur was chasing me on mars and i couldn't get away <laughs> well that's interesting you're probably having these dreams because you're wearing the patch throughout the night yeah. colorful active dreams are very common with people to wear the patch for 24 hours because you're getting a constant source of nicotine while you sleep. Uh, now, are the dreams bothering you? Well, to be honest with you, Doc, they are kind of freaking me out. Okay. All right. What I want you to do is take off the patch before you go to bed at night, and then first thing in the morning, put a new one on. Okay? And that, that should get rid of the dreams. <laughs> well, well, that would be great. Everything else is going okay, except that I noticed um, I've been starting to think about smoking whenever I get stressed out at work. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a lot of changes there. And, uh, I got a new boss. Oh, it really makes me nervous. Uh, matter of fact, I really wanted to smoke after my first meeting with him. Well, Angelo, it is important that you understand that smoking doesn't get rid of stress. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Smoking causes stress. Yes. Every time you take a puff on a cigarette, your blood pressure and your heart rate spike up very quickly and then they drop just as quickly as soon as you finish taking that puff and when you smoke you are doing that hundreds of times a day and all of that up and down that puts a lot of stress on the body and when you can't smoke that causes stress too but oh, oh. well, why did i feel more relaxed when i did smoke okay i have a handout that i'm going to give you that will explain this in detail but i will quickly summarize what's happening Whenever you take a puff on a cigarette, you're breathing deeply, every single puff. It's kind of like the deep breathing that they teach in yoga. And secondly, when you smoke, you're distracting yourself from things that are bothering you. It's like taking a break. Deep breathing, taking a break, those are two things that will really calm you down. But those are two things that you can do without a cigarette, right? Yeah, sure. Then there's a third thing that's going on. Stress and withdrawal, they feel about the same. Irritability, anxiousness, restlessness, impatience. Oh, okay. You may not realize it, but you are in withdrawal much of the day. When you smoke a cigarette, you feel better. That's because you've gotten rid of the withdrawal. But because withdrawal and stress feel the same, you think you've gotten rid of the stress. Well, I never thought of that way before. Angela, it's important to remember that a cigarette, it can't tell you how to handle your new boss or what to do about all those problems at work. It's an inanimate object. You may think that smoking is helping you solve your problems, but you're forgetting that a cigarette, you can't do that. You've been handling your stress your whole life. So give yourself some credit and not the cigarette. Well, it makes a lot of sense. But I'm going to need to take some time to think about this. Okay. I'll make sure I get you that handout and take some time and read through it. And then start to think about things that you can do that will help you reduce the stress. Like exercise, yoga, meditation. The handout does have some local programs that are listed on the back. Thanks, Doc. I'll read it. Okay. And then we can talk about it when I see you next time. Great. All right, guys, that literally was about four minutes. All right, Angelo, your blood pressure. I'm not going to watch it again. Um, 
So I hope that shows you, if for those of you in a clinical setting, how easily you can incorporate something like this into a visit. You know, he came in there to talk about the patch, but then mentioned this, and then she was able just to very nicely segue into that and explain it. Um, these videos come from the Rx for Change program. Uh, if you want to look at other ones, just Google that and you can access, there's probably 50, 45 of them that give you all kinds of examples, different situations and, and how to deal with them. All right, so I wanted to end on that to give you a little bit of um, an example of how to incorporate this. Are there, we have a few minutes left, are there any questions, any comments, any issues uh, that I can answer before we go? So we've got a comment. Uh, we are getting some comments, uh, Frank, very informative and, and, and thank you. Uh, thank you for, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I just have a very quick question, you know, if you don't mind. Uh, um, sure. I just, uh, I would like to ask the participants whether they have a smoking cessation uh, plan in place or if they refer patients, you know, just to have an idea how they, whether it, or not they have used these, any of these techniques you know, or if they uh, refer patients. Can you please uh, just answer whether or not you have a smoking cessation in place uh, or whether you refer patients? Yeah. Um, hi there, uh, this is Manfred. Uh, we're representing Bay Community Health um, Center located in Fremont, uh, California. Um, I, I thank you for this, uh, for the sessions, for this all the collaborative uh, uh, um, sessions and looking forward to the next one. Yeah, so uh, uh, we do we do tobacco cessation uh, as well as uh, you know the referrals. So what I do, uh, so the we receive referrals within the agency, you know, from the providers, from the primary care providers, or even the the behavioral health providers. And uh, so I receive the referrals and then I, I take it uh, from there on, you know, calling the patients, reaching out, uh, responding to the referrals and following up and, and the rest, I, then I just take care of everything, you know, um, providing them the medication uh, support one-on-ones uh, and then again, connecting them again with the providers, with all the, uh, uh, providing all the pharmacy management, pharmacy coordination, medications and uh, all that good stuff. So, um, yeah. So with with uh, with uh, with Bayer Community Health, we do we do tobacco cessation and counseling and um, and uh, we are open to the external referrals as well uh, from you know from uh, from the outside the agency. Um, so yeah, th this is just basically a gist of uh, what we do. Excellent. Thank you so much, Manfred. Uh, that is really good information. Uh, uh, and thank you for sharing. Uh, do you have any questions uh, for Manfred? Uh, 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 no questions uh, so far. Um, uh, I liked how we started with the, uh, you know, with the stress management and, you know, all the relaxation techniques. Uh, and then uh, I, I really like how we how you know how you cut down into all the good sessions and um and the next one is the relapse prevention so uh, i think uh, no questions but um you know i'm happy to be here thank you thank you so yeah. much uh so uh we are over time but if you have any questions if somebody else has any questions or of uh, somebody else would like to share uh, their experience at the health center, uh, let us know. Otherwise, we can continue our, our, our uh, chat uh, uh, next next week, uh, Frank, unless you have anything else. No, everybody, you all have my email. So if you have any questions um, specific to this or anything else, please email me. I'll be happy to um, follow up with you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. We have a post survey. If you uh, can take the time, you know, if you have any questions, please make sure that you can contact us and uh, follow us on any of the social media uh, uh, channels. And thank you and see you next week. All right. Thanks. Have a, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye.